That's the sleepy sign. Welcome. This is another episode of the Radical Parenting Podcast. My name is Tony Shawcross. This is Kara Porba. It sounded great. Good. We uh, are talking about ideas that align with uh, our work in radical honesty, uh, align with the book from Brad Blanton, Radical Parenting. And uh, each month we're going to talk about some other ideas, ideas that relate to radical honesty and radical parenting, but uh, hopefully also review some books and resources that uh, uh, Kara and I are steering each other and other friends are steering us towards. Occasionally we'll have other guests. Um, last episode we talked about uh, how to talk so kids will listen and listen so kids will talk, uh, which is a great book. And uh, this week uh, we're going to talk mostly about Janet Lansbury's book, Elevating Child Care, Elevating Child Care, A Respectful Guide to Parenting. Uh, anything you want to add, Kara? I love Janet Lansbury so much. Kara said she was so grateful that, that someone introduced her to Janet as she was uh, first having her, her baby. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Let's talk about the book. I think I want to go through some of the core takeaways for me that are really just aligned with what I already, you know, think and believe and plan to, to incorporate into my parenting and then some things I had never really considered or some things that like helped me see, you know, what, what, uh, my, my baby's mom is doing, you know, through a different light and, and, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it was just, it was, it was a great book. I love both these books. They both like in two different, very different ways, uh, touch on some of these core issues that we care about, um, that Kara and I know, I, I know care about in terms of parenting. And the key one for this book for me was respect. That was just like, respecting your child as like an autonomous human respecting your child in the way you're going to you may not treat your child in the way you're going to treat them when they're a 30 year old or a 40 year old but you're going to respect them in the same way you would respect them when they're an adult uh, and yeah it was, it was really inspiring janet uses the word trust a lot like in her she has a podcast and a blog as well and like trusting the child's process that whatever they're doing in the moment is um, is what they is what is right for them, especially as an infant, because infants aren't, you know, going to be running around destroying stuff. So toddlers is another world. But with infants, it was such a relief to me to realize that I didn't need to entertain mm -hmm. my daughter, that I didn't need to do a bunch of fancy stuff or like fancy activities or things that I could just trust her to her natural curiosity in the world and trust her to do all of her development on her own. Like all that is going to happen without me. Yeah. And I can kind of sit back and bask in the glory of yeah. it and support, support her, you know, oh. without like, I don't have as many jobs to do as yeah. I thought. That, and that's the relief for me and why I've gotten so addicted to Janet Lansbury is um, I keep coming back to her over and over again because it's it's a way to like lay down some jobs that are not mine. Yeah. You know, parenting is hard enough work as it is. We don't need to like be taking on more stuff that we is not really ours to worry about. Totally. There's so many great examples of that in the book. And you know, one of them is also not worrying about like crawling on time, walking on time, all of that, just trusting that like where they're at is perfect. And that really sets up a dynamic for you with your child. It sets up some patterns and, you know, like worrying about all those things or feeling like it's your job to entertain them, tracking like, oh, are they three weeks late and turning their ability to turn over or whatever. Um, that sets up a dynamic that, that, you know, even if it's not psychologically hindering your child in any way at this age, uh, you know, I imagine it would in later ages. I think it is at that age too. Yeah. I mean, like the achievement or that the goal or something is more important. In the past. Some benchmark is somehow more important than just like the, the natural exploration of movement or, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. 
the book starts with this story about like a birthday party and this isn't it wasn't that poignant of a story it just really related to us to an experience i had as a young child um where janet was talking about how they set up like this really extravagant kind of birthday celebration for for her daughter and then the kids ended up ignoring all this stuff that they had done like put all this work and effort into and janet because of this work she's been doing you know they were able to just like trust that the kids were doing exactly what they need to be doing not trying to shuffle them back into like these you know courses or, or you know experiences that they had you know invested hours and hours in building for the party and it, it reminded me of the story when i was a little kid our like big amusement park in town was called Elitch's. <clears throat> and um my my dad for maybe like my fifth birthday or sixth birthday or something like that took me and a group of friends, probably like six or eight of us or something like that, to Elitch's. And so we're on the way to Elitch's and we're getting onto the highway, those kind of like green belt kind of like, you know, loops where you get on the highway. And my dad's car broke down. And I think we had two cars worth of kids going, um, but we certainly couldn't pile all the kids into one car safely. And so the car broke down on that like on ramp with like a grass, grass circle in the middle of the road and so rather than take the take half of the kids to the place or do like a loop back because it was like an hour-long drive my parents are like okay the kids are just going to play here for a while we're going to go try and fix the car we're going to whatever and so they end up taking like four hours to to fix the car and and we're just having the time of our lives in this circle and they probably spent a couple hundred dollars or something a lot of money for them at the time probably to like get us all tickets to Elitch's. They really wanted us to go to Elitch's. And I remember me and some of the kids thinking it was like the best birthday party ever, just playing in this like grass circle. And we never went to Elitch's. That was the whole, our whole birthday party it was just playing in this wow. grass circle. Wow. So, yeah. What did you do in the grass circle? Do you I remember? Remember, I don't have many memories from that age, but you know, I think we just made up games. Like Janet talks about yeah. her, her kids making up games. Yeah. And it's probably like a magical island or something too, because when do you ever get to set foot on that grass circle in the middle yeah. of the road? Yeah. It's like totally. Uncharted territory. Yeah. And so much of this book just like reminded me of the work you and I do in Radical Honesty. There's, you know, this, this idea that acknowledging your children's feelings, not fixing them, not mitigating them, not trying to shift them from unhappiness to happiness or whatever, allows your children to experience these feelings so that they they come and go uh is like a sentiment or a, a thought that you and i've been steeped in since we met in, in greece yeah. 10 years ago or something yeah six or seven maybe yeah, yeah. the concept of time uh there's a quote that she has that i want to read even if it's not direct that that i wrote down while i was reading it just said every thought desire and feeling every expression this is like what she wants to say and impart to her child every thought desire and feeling every expression of your mind body and heart is lovable acknowledged and important it's like that's the message she wants her child to have you're crying you're screaming you're happy you're anything that's what i want in all of my relationships especially you know, one with my child. Uh, it's so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And that we, we want our children to share with us, you know, their, their pain and their disappointments and stuff. And um, that it's even though it's so painful, I feel like as parents, you know, I, I, I still hate for my my kid to hurt or feel sad or disappointed and i would so it's still there's something so sweet and lovely about being able to be with her in that place even as painful as it is that we can do it together and i can be with her and she's so far shares everything with me and i know that that will change at some point and it is my number one goal and hope that she will keep sharing with me, you know? 
if doing that comes naturally to someone, they are so much wiser than I am. Like, yeah. it comes naturally to me to fix, just fix, you know? And, and it's, and I love it. I mean, I've been, I've been practicing it in radical honesty, the, you know, the meetups that I lead, the, the workshops I help co-lead. That's when I get the most practice of just reminding myself, like, don't fix it. Just be with it. Be with them. Be with it. Let these things come and go. And yeah, I would love to meet someone for whom that's just like, they just kind of know, yeah, my child is upset. My child is crying. My child is even suffering to some extent. The way I'm going to comfort them is not by fixing it, not by distracting them from it, not by resisting it but by just like being in it with them yeah yeah and i love what it's very it's so similar to radical honesty you know when janet lansbury will often says things like welcome the feelings Mm -hmm. roll out the red carpet for those feelings Mm -hmm. so it's like we're really uh honor it's sort of a reverence you know for like that these are really special moments, actually. Mm-hmm. I have a couple examples of when I think I really did a good job. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and I don't think I always do a good job. And I feel really proud about, like, a couple weeks ago, um, when, I, when my daughter's dad was dropping her off, um, we met at the farmer's market, and... Uh, she said goodbye and he drove away and I, um, we were getting ready to go. And I, I looked back to see if she, if her car seat, to see if her buckles were buckled. Uh-huh. Oh, car seat. I had no inclination that anything was about to happen. Right. And I look back there and she was just quietly crying with tears streaming down her face. And this is not a quiet child, right. Of mine. She normally is, she will cry real loud and big. So to me, this one, this, it was really, um, it was like a different kind of sadness that felt really, I felt really sad and I almost started crying. I may have started crying. And so we started talking and she said, you know, that she was sad to say goodbye to her dad. And I might cry right now telling this story. She's been saying more things lately about, well, we used to live in the same house together and, you know, why can we live in the same house together again and stuff like that. So I can go off in adult land with all of that conversation. But in that moment, you know, I just didn't get too scared or about like, oh God, like our breakup has forever scarred our child it's like you know she's just sad in this moment saying goodbye to her dad she loves her dad and I think that's what I said to her was like yeah you really love your dad you really love him and it's hard to say goodbye you know it looks like you're feeling really sad and she would you know kind of say yeah I'm like sad to say goodbye so I went and unbuckled her car seat and she just crawled into my lap in the front of the car and we sort of cuddled and cried and hugged and stuff. It was really beautiful. It was really beautiful and sweet. And I, I am crying. And you know, after a couple of minutes of that, she got interested in playing with the steering wheel and wanting to, you know, play. And she was done. She was done. It was, you know, and I eventually got her back in her car seat and we, you know, drove off and that was it for her. And so I'm so glad that I know that that's a possibility, you know, that I can just say, you really love your dad and you miss him and it's hard to say goodbye and you feel sad. And there's no, there's no need to say like, oh, well, you're going to see him again in five days or do you want to call him or blah, 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 or like, how can we fix this? Mm-hmm. I mean, in my mind, I was like, we've got to get back together. Like, this is terrible for her. But that's the adult way. That's not what she's thinking. And that is something I've learned from Janet is that we as adults go to these bigger fears. Mm -hmm. And it's that's not really what's happening for the child necessarily, Mm -hmm. you know, so it I think the ability to not make it about us. It's it's I think it's the parents trying to reassure themselves most of the time, (laughs) even more than the kid, you know. 
Yeah, and our desire to fix other people's pain rather than sit with it is in part from our own like inability to just sit with sit with it and recognize that as part of the journey and the experience of life. Yeah. And yeah, it's so hard for me to do and it, I'm so glad I've been getting some practice at it, even though it's still it's still very challenging for me. And when it's most challenging, the like Jedi trick that I very rarely mastered is when that's aimed or blamed at you. Like I'm sad, I'm hurting, and it's your <laughs> fault. And in that moment, still be able to just be with them and be accepting of it in that same way. You know, like I'm sad, not just because I love and miss my dad, but I'm sad because you've done something wrong and I'm mad at you. And, mm-hmm. and being able to just sit and be with that in that same way is a, uh, it's just like next level and yeah. something I'm, I'm going to be working towards and striving for, not only with children, but just in general. Yeah. And that's really good to do with kids. I think that they, to let them be mad at us and to not have it be a big thing of like, like, yeah, you know, you're so mad at me right now. I get it. You know, you thought such and such was going to happen and, or what, you know, whatever it is. And like, I weirdly cherish those moments Mm -hmm. because I know how good it feels, you know, to be able to be mad at someone and have them be comfortable with it and be okay with it. And that is strength, right? It feels so good, right? If you can tell somebody how upset you are and how mad at you are at them Mm -hmm. and they're, they're comfortable with that. Yeah, it's not like, okay. It talks now, about that a lot, just that comfort, that that's a, such an amazing, confident leadership that we give to our kids by just being comfortable with whatever they throw at us. Like, it's okay if you're pissed at me and want, like, say that you hate me and want me to die. Well, my kids never said that, but mm-hmm. sure, it'll come at some point. Yeah, every feeling and expression you have is lovable acknowledged and important to me even when that feeling and that expression is just like total anger and resentment at me it's just like that makes me want to cry and i just think about that i just because i think it's unimaginable for most kids and i imagine it was maybe unimaginable for me that it was like not easy for me to be mad at my parents even though i was and we all are one of the core ideas behind radical honesty is what you resist persists. So like you're mad at your parents and you feel like you need to resist it. That's something that you hold on to for the rest of your life in a way that you never would if you can just let it come and go and just like live through it and, and know that you can get mad at your parents and they're not going to go anywhere. And they're not going to just get mad or back at you or take away your allowance or whatever. It's just part of our experience. So. Yeah. Did you say you had another story like the like the one about Elsa Jane missing her dad that you wanted to share that you're proud of? I want you to celebrate all your all your accomplishments. Yeah, right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and this one is maybe a closer example to what happens more often mm-hmm. because that one in the car about her dad it's so easy to empathize with that, right? Like yeah. I know how much fun she has with her dad. I know how much she misses him and he misses her, right? So that's very, on an adult level, like real easy to empathize with in a way. Even though I can also go to that place of like, this is my decision. Well, both of our decision that's impacting her and she's feeling pain, you know, because of something we decided. And that that's okay, you know, that she's capable of feeling pain, like really real pain. So anyway, this other example was about a favorite pair of pants Mm -hmm. that I knew she liked because she wore them all the time to the point where they had a hole in them and they were too small and that they were all faded. I like never throw clothes away. Never. I always donate them or find someone to hand them down to. But these pair of pants, I mean, they were done. They were like threadbare holes, the whole deal. And uh, I I threw them away when she was at school. And I didn't think too much about it. I was just thinking, I was just, I, cause I, 
we have a massive amount of hand-me-downs. So it's, I spend a lot of time just culling the herds, right? Like I've hardly ever bought a piece of clothing for her. So I just, you know, I make decisions all the time without her. But in this particular case, I threw away her favorite pants. And the next time she went looking for them, she was looking for those pants. And I sort of knew it. I think I probably knew when I threw them away, I was probably like thinking, oh, maybe I need to wait until she's here or something. And she was so, I could have just said, <laughs> it's so tempting to say, I don't know where those pants are. Gosh, where could they be? But I told her that I threw them away, which I think is important to do. I don't know. I mean, there's so many situations where we can just lie to our kids and kind of take the easy route. Mm -hmm. But I told her, you know, that I threw them away. Mm -hmm. And she went to go look in the trash can, but I had already taken the trash out. I think they were already like, had been taken off by the trash truck, right? They weren't like salvageable. And she was so sad and mad and like grieving these pants that she lost, you know? And I guess, it's pretty understandable, you know, if somebody threw my favorite pants away, I'd be, even if they had a hole in them, I'd be like, those are my pants. What are you doing going into my room and taking my pants and throwing them away? So anyway, same deal. You know, I just sat on the kitchen floor and stayed with her while she cried and just like said simple stuff like, I'm so sorry that your pants are gone and you really loved those and you wanted to wear them and you were looking for them. And I don't know, it was a special moment for me because I even think we were late for something. And I was like, this is what's most important right now. This is like, and that's something that I really learned from Janet Lansbury, I think, is that, and radical honesty, is that those uncomfortable moments, it like that is where it's at. That is where our relationship grows and builds. It's like, gold so instead of thinking of it as like this disaster where like everything's going wrong we're late you know she's crying whatever where it's like a golden opportunity actually for us to to connect yeah so there's a chapter chapter five that's called good grief and i think both the examples you shared are both a little bit of grieving, like you said, she's grieving losing these pants. She's grieving saying goodbye to her dad, even for a few days. And um, <clears throat> Janet, Janet writes, and again, these are loose quotes, but look at every sadness and grief as a practice or opportunity to fully experience and express our grief. She tells the story of like a mom leaving a room in like a daycare and, and how we respond to that models future grief you should you want to shut it down you want to distract them with a toy whatever and she tells this story about the boy crying because his mom left the room like, you can just go to the bathroom and mm -hmm. she just she just kept him company and gave understanding and acknowledgement and she said that eventually like like elsie jane reached for the steering wheel or whatever he reached for a ball but she didn't present the ball she didn't distract him she's like this is the moment this is a this is an opportunity to just fully experience our grief and then eventually it came flowed through him it didn't go around it he went through it and and then he was ready to play with the ball and she even talks about how then when the mom gets back he wasn't full he was like mad at the mom and so then that's the next kind of goal that you can sit with and yeah. i think i think I don't know if she wrote this or I wrote this, but I wrote, if we can sturdy ourselves to deal with what it brings up in us when we hear our children express sadness and discomfort, we can teach our children that the full spectrum of their experience, that everything in their mind and body is okay. Pain is just part of the human experience. I love that whole chapter on called Good Grief. Yeah, it's just like, just what you said, and it is modeling it, you know, eventually if you're lucky, your daughter is going to experience your death and she's going to experience big griefs and we want her to not shut those down and we want her to not be practiced at 
feeling like those things can't be fully experienced and expressed and and how we model those initial griefs, greetings that they experience around their pants and their dad is is how they're going to model yeah, grief later in life. So yeah, I loved that chapter and it's so hard for me. I just want to fix everything I want. My life is about maximizing joy and minimizing suffering. Mm. But experience it and it's it's a paradox to acknowledge that like minimizing suffering means not shortcutting it not going around it it means like stewing in it Mm. and i can't do that for myself and i can't do that for i mean i struggle to do that for myself and i struggle to do that for anyone who i view as being my responsibility or in my care in some way it's so hard to do with my nieces and my niece and my nephews and partners. And I like what you said about her. Um, I wonder if that is her words. I, I like those words of like sturdying ourselves. And to me, that just means our practice as the parent is being with our experience. The kid is going to have their experience, you know, unless we go in and try to manage they're going to do their thing and they're great at it. Mm-hmm. And then we, in that moment are having our own experience and our own discomfort mm-hmm. and being with the physical sensations of it. I have this saying that I use with my um, violin students, the fast is slow and slow is fast. So like, when you're practicing an instrument, if you play fast all the time, you just don't learn as well. You don't learn a piece as fast because you're always kind of halfway faking it and Mm kind of, you're like, it just takes forever to get good at anything. If you're, if you're always speeding through Mm -hmm. and to slow down and take your time, that's where we can actually like process and really get somewhere. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I love, you know, what Brad Blanton, our radical honesty mentor always says is like, just like spend a few more seconds there. And I have to remember that it's not about like perfection or like perfect mindfulness or anything. It's like just a few more seconds is valuable. Mm -hmm stewing in the discomfort i don't want to go down that rabbit hole but the best musician i've ever seen in my life is this guy stanley jordan and he teaches like a master class uh or used to at least where he 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 instead of telling people to like really challenge themselves and he applies it to anything like if you're snowboarding and you're like a green skier don't go to blue and black like just stay on green and just kill the green you know Mm -hmm. And he's like, if you're a musician and all you ever do is play Mary Had a Little Lamb, but you can get that to be like the most perfect Mary Had a Little Lamb ever, you get practiced at at quality, at perfection. And if you're always on the edge of your inabilities, you get practiced at at like imperfection. So I don't know if that even relates to what you were saying with what you teach. Yeah, I think it really does. Yeah, because it's a different process. Mm -hmm. And I think it applies to kids as well, because kids move at a different pace than we do. Even though I think they're, I mean, especially babies, right? They're processing so much because they haven't already categorized the world. So they're actually processing every stimulus instead of we've, we sort of dis i mean and this is where bias comes from right like we make categories and then we start just sort of filing things and dismissing things so that we're not constantly overwhelmed right but babies basically are constantly overwhelmed just sitting in a room with nothing happening because there's so much new stimulus but then i think even when they get older so my daughter's almost five so it seems to me like she moves really fast because she's very active, she's very physical, she talks a lot, but there's still, I have to remember, there's a slowness to like making a transition, to processing the transition, to certain things 
you know, if I try to rush her, oh boy, it's going to take so much longer. If I can slow myself down, we actually have an easier time, you know, and we can get out the door or whatever it is. I, I have to slow down to her. I don't even want to call it pace, but it's just like there's something about fully processing everything that takes a little more time. I think one of the great crutches Janet introduces, and I think it was originally Magda Gerber introducing it, is that sports casting idea where that'll help you slow down. You know, it's like a great crutch to, to do it because like you're in a little bit of a hurry. You see Elsie James struggling with her shoe tying and you're very tempted to just go show her how to do it. She needs to learn. It's your job to teach. You go and teach her how to do it. You know, Janet and Magda say, no, just sports cast. Like you're really struggling with, with, with your shoe. You're really trying to tie it. Yeah. You're really working at that. I can see you really working at that. And like, I oh, that. I see I that, that that strap is, has come out of the, we don't even deal with shoelaces. We're yeah. not to shoelaces yet. It's all yeah. about the Velcro. Yeah. And uh, she's great with her shoes, but like occasionally the Velcro strap comes all the way out of the hole, right? And so, yeah, I'm actually, it's such good practice for me to actually sports cast myself. Uh -huh. This is my new... <laughs> practice when I feel myself getting frustrated or like riled up to be able to describe what is actually happening is really helpful yeah. instead of being in my stories about like we're late and we're always late and can't we get to to someplace like on time for once in our lives and what is wrong with us right that's how I get myself riled up. Yeah. Mommy said the whole world's going to think we're flakes and the whole world thinks that we're F ups. Yeah. Right. And like all the other kids get there on time. Like, why can't we get there on time? And, uh, we could go into reasons for that another time. I, it, I think it's helpful for me to sports cast myself yeah. and be like, I, I wanted to leave five minutes ago. Or I don't know. That's that's kind of even too abstract. Yeah. But just to say, like, say like I'm, I'm starting to get. I'm feeling really frustrated, and and I'm ready to go. I'm, I've also learned that it's a lot easier for her to get on board with my agenda if I just like calmly go about my agenda. So if it's time to leave, instead of me getting involved in her getting dressed or something, like, well, we can't leave until she gets dressed that doesn't really help. I just get myself complete. I mean, I mean like coat on stuff that needs to go in the car is in the car. I even will go out and start the car. And by the time I do all of that and I'm actually ready to leave, usually she is too. Mm. Versus me like starting to feel like I have to meddle with her of mm. like, well, I can't uh, like, she doesn't have any shoes on. We got to go. It's like, I am actually, I'm kind of learning that, if I lead the way, she will come on board and I don't have to like get, get so involved. Mm. Yeah, that's such a, that would be such a more peaceful way of being. Janet also talks about like best parents or something like that, but it's just this kind of like calm, accepting kind of like Zen way of, of parenting. I think what you just described is good. And some of us just aren't programmed that way, you know? And so it takes some practice and you do that, what you're doing, not like this peaceful Zen master, but, but like this person who's just acknowledging that it's, I'm nervous. I'm the kind of person who wants to control everything that's going around and I'm not going to, I'm going to like, yeah, focus on myself and have some trust and, and just see what happens. There's so much overlap between these books and, and radical honesty and radical parenting. One thing I love that um, so radical honesty, radical parenting borrows from Zen, borrows from a lot of things, but it's it's it mostly borrows from um, from Gestalt therapy and the work of Fritz Perls. And there is a section where Janet talks about giving words to your children's experience and, and sports casting and reflecting the feelings that you you see in your children. But she says and this is what's so aligned with, with, with Fritz's work is like, don't jump to conclusions. Like don't, 
don't assume you know your child is experiencing whatever like always respect them the key word in this book for me was respect and and you ask them like oh i see you i see you you really looking at your shoes i are you frustrated you know i see that look on your face are you are you frustrated with those are you wanting help are you you know, whatever, just like asking those questions because we're so tempted with the people we love and the people we know best to, to think we know them. And we're wrong. I mean, the most insightful yeah. Zen person on the planet is still projecting so much of the time. They're not just reading other people, you know. Paul Ekman or, or, or Gottman or Sylvan, the people who know like the facial action coding system stuff and study it like the back of their hands, they're still projecting sometimes. So mm. certainly you and I and anyone listening to this podcast are. Yeah. So I loved that. I love that, you know, you're just right. always sports casting, but not just like saying, oh, you're angry. Oh, you're uncomfortable. It's like asking questions, even if they can't answer. You know, that children get practice at naming their experience that way if we are actually genuinely interested you know not because we want to shut it down or fix it or whatever and um yeah i am constantly surprised and i think especially as adults we're wrong about kids a lot just because you know our brains work differently like we're in a totally different place and so yeah i think i'm wrong at least half the time if i see that my daughter's upset I'll, I'll think it's something and she'll, she'll say it's something totally else, you know, and that's kind of awesome conversation to be able to have with her, you know, at four years old, she can tell me what, what she's upset about. And one of the things that I love most about Janet Lansbury is, which is also super similar, I think, to radical honesty and gestalt therapy is that whatever the superficial thing is kind of like an escape valve for so if my daughter is upset about her pants her favorite pants getting thrown away it's probably a little bit about the pants but also that that is an opportunity for her to release a bunch of stress and disappointment and stuff that may have not gotten fully processed at some time and how healthy that is for her to like to let that out yeah um so that really really framing it that way in my mind changes a lot for me in terms of whatever the volume or or intensity of what she has going on trusting that it is healthy for her to release that and have that escape valve and to hope that, you know, she's getting to hopefully process a lot more stuff than I did when I was little. And the benefit of that, you know, I can't really imagine because I don't think that many kids have been brought up that way until recently. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think so either. And I it's wish- a it whole was... new generation, man. Yeah, I wish that's changing and this is taking off, but yeah, I worry it's not, but we're gonna help that yeah. in any way yeah. we can. Um, one other chapter I wanted to talk about that's way further down in the book, it's chapter 28, <clears throat> it was talking about how if, you're, if you find yourself yelling at your child, the more you find yourself frustrated, the more it's a sign that you're not taking care of yourself. And I thought of you and I thought of Bonnie, the mother of my child. There's a, in that chapter, it says we want to we, we wanna accept their darkest mood and their harshest feelings, even when directed at you. And, and she also talks in that chapter about how if we see our, what, what, how we see our children becomes true. If we see them as needy and, and needing us to help with everything, that kind of becomes their personality. If we see them as like competent individuals who can take care of this themselves, that becomes their personality. And, and we put so much strain on ourselves to fulfill every need for our child. And that prevents us from taking care of ourselves. And it, and it robs our children of developing into like self-reliant, you know, self-confident humans who just know that they can figure stuff out on their own. 
and they can deal with the frustration of not figuring out stuff on their own, you know, like that, how does someone get good at an instrument? It's, it's that they're willing to sit with struggle for a, for a while and they don't have someone that's rescuing them from every little time they can't tie their shoe. They're dealing with, with frustration yeah so and yeah i love the idea of just like don't focus on why your kids so difficult and why you're so frustrated with them focus on how you're not taking care of yourself yeah when you're frustrated or angry at your child yeah and then That's, take care of yourself yes <laughs> and i i imagine this seems to be harder for moms than for dads and i this is my primary focus right now because I was starting to just get so frustrated and irritated. Usually at the end of the day, usually like around bedtime, I'm so into being a parent and I'm so into, it's like even when my daughter's with her dad for two days, I'm working for most of one of them. And on the other day, half the time, I'm like reading parenting books and like hanging out with my friends and talking about parenting or talking about my daughter, you know? And I started to be like, this is getting crazy. Yeah. Like I, I got into like human adult, like yeah. stuff uh, that yeah. has nothing to do with kids or parenting, you know, part of so why I, I'm back on, I do yoga every morning when I wake up just for a few minutes, you know, but like, it is my lifeline. And at night I have a thing where you know, lately bedtime's been going okay, but when it's not, you know, I just tell Elsie Jane, it you know, because it doesn't work for me to get like upset. You know, that doesn't help her go to sleep, obviously. I sort of collect myself and I make sure that I'm like really <laughs> not saying it in like a punitive way. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll say, sometimes more successfully than others, I'll say, I'm, I'm available for the next, 15 minutes or whatever um, to help you get in bed because she really what likes me. She really likes to read a story and have a song and I scratch her back and I go through the, we call them the instructions. I go through the autogenic relaxation that yeah. we do at radical honesty workshops. And that's how she falls asleep most nights. And I lay in the bed with her and I'm only willing to do that for so long. I got to a point where I was like laying and it was getting longer and longer and I would lay in bed with her for a long time. And I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> this is like crazy. I'm not going to spend two hours every night putting my kid to bed. Mm -hmm. So um, I tell her I'm going to, I'm available for this amount of time and I'm happy to help you get in bed. And if you're, um, if, you know, if you're wanting to wait longer, that's fine. And you can stay up and play in your room and, but you'll be on your own. You'll have to put yourself to bed. And a couple of times she's chosen that and then hasn't been too happy about it. Mm -hmm. So now she usually is like, okay, well, I really want your help. So let's go ahead and do it now. Yeah. And uh, it just doesn't work. If I'm unregulated mm -hmm. or whatever the word is, it doesn't, it doesn't work. You know, I have to be like calm. Mm -hmm in order for that not to turn into like a big guilt trip thing. Yeah. And it sounds like you're learning that the way to be genuinely calm is to like, I don't like using the word set your boundaries, but to take care of yourself. I really like that way of phrasing it. Yeah. It's just like to take care of yourself. And that that's okay. Mm -hmm. that it's okay. Not just okay. But the weird paradox is that it's, better you know it's it's right. so much better for you and it's better for you yeah yeah my mom was a great mother and you know i loved that she bought herself a little cheap catamaran and that she played guitar and that she played piano and that she played tennis and that she was an avid reader you know it's her life wasn't just about me i mean i right. didn't often feel like it was but like she was a well-rounded human with lots of interests and lots of friends and and, yeah. and it wouldn't have served me or her if she <laughs> she was already probably yet yeah, too too wrapped up in just being a mom you know and she still was all those other great things to a lot of other 
I mean, that sounds like a cool lady that you want to know and you want to hang out with, right? Yeah. Whereas someone that's just reading parenting books like Kara, <laughs> boring. <laughs> right. Yeah, totally. Uh, so one thing I had not considered, I don't think, really before before reading this book is this idea about um, her, her and Magda Gerber really suggesting against giving praise. Um, mm -hmm. There is a quote she quoted from Magda Gerber that said, let your child's inner joy be self-motivated. Yeah, we don't want to teach our children to seek praise from others. We want to do what feels fulfilling intrinsically. With my niece and nephews, I'm always saying like, good job, that's awesome. You know, I'm always whatever. And I don't, I like thinking about like, not just the short-term ramifications, but for me, that's a lot easier to do. It's a lot easier to put myself in check when I feel any discomfort in my body. Like when I'm frustrated, when I'm mad at someone, I know that the best parts of me don't come out then. And so it's kind of easy to put myself easier to put myself in check when I'm frustrated or whatever with a child. But it's hard when I'm just like loving on them. Like you're so <laughs> I've been good at that. I love watching you do that. And, uh, but I, I want to put myself in check with that too. Now reading, you know, like it makes sense. We're teaching our children not to just have the intrinsic joy of Irish dancing. That's what my, my, my niece used to do. Uh, it's to seek my praise and to feed off the praise she's getting from others, which is just so much less fulfilling. Well, and I, yeah, I love this whole conversation about um, praise. And I think that praise is different than acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't think that you, it means that we can't say stuff or to just say like, so I think it's similar to, you know, what we were talking about from how to talk. So yeah. kids will listen is descriptions are, <laughs> This is an ironic statement. Descriptions are better than evaluations, right? My evaluation is that descriptions are better than evaluations. So I think you could say like, wow, I'm seeing you dancing. I'm so excited. Like your feet are moving so fast and you've learned all these steps and it looks like you're really having fun. And like, I'm so happy watching you dance. Mm -hmm. And that would be way so much better than good job. Yeah. Okay. No, rather than saying better, that would I imagine that would be so much more powerful for the child mm -hmm. than if an adult says "good job," because yeah, but, adults say that it all the time, and kids are just like whatever. But one of the mean things too is it, nothing. in a way, it you know the respect theme of this book. Praise distracts your child from what they're doing, and it's it's about your judgment or evaluation, or even in your example, your experience of theirs. And it's not wrong to share your experience, but but it's not about you. It's about them and the like, the 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 the, the experience they're having in the moment. So I don't want to discount what you just said, or, yeah. or but but I loved. I hadn't considered that, and and I'm and I look forward to to withholding my my praise and finding other ways <laughs> to, to to maybe share the joy I'm getting out of that. that yeah. That, don't distract them from what they're doing. Or even later, yeah. just say it. Just like, I love watching you do that. I love, like, it could be after the fact or whatever. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid, I just Maybe wanted my when mom. They're, when they're making a bid for that, you know? Mm -hmm. Because if a kid is totally enthralled and in 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 the midst of what they're doing, yeah. they don't need anybody getting in the middle of that. No. So maybe there are moments where even just simple acknowledgement is getting in the way. And then there's moments where, you know, like the baby finally gets to the ball or whatever, and they mm -hmm. look at you mm -hmm. and then, then you're in relationship. Yeah. And then it's like, yeah, I see you're touching the ball. I see that. <laughs> like you worked so hard to get there. Um, I, th I think there are moments for that when the child is, is, looking to the relationship yeah i want to hear people say feed your children when they're hungry let them drink when they're thirsty don't distract mm. or give them toys these are some like short little takeaways don't sit up or change the position for your baby the position your baby's in is perfect and if you change it that they're going to come to expect that i hadn't thought of that you know 
Uh, don't I'm rush any developmental you. steps. Talk to them in a natural tone, not a baby voice. Tell them the truth always. She told the story of that doctor that like she had already told her daughter, honestly, you're going to go into the doctor's office and he's going to put a needle in your shoulder and it's going to hurt and I'm going to be there with you and whatever. And her doctor does some magic trick that's like pretending none of the reality is real and and tries to like it's distract her, whatever. And we praise those doctors and probably we should. It's great that they put so much effort into it. But yeah, I mean, the way I want my child to be treated is with honesty and respect and dealing with reality as it is. They can handle reality as it is. Yeah, the doctor's office is really a tough one because though, at least at our doctor's office, the nurses and even the doctors are, it, it's really the nurses that do most of the actual, the shots and the procedures and stuff. One time, I guess Elsie Jane must have been sick. One time a nurse, put, she was very young, she was probably one or so, put a thermometer in her butt without saying I still feel so bad about that because I saw the look on her face. She was just so surprised. I mean, I don't think she'd ever had anything in her butthole, you know? And the nurse just was taking her temperature and probably does that a million times every day and thought nothing of it. And I just saw the like, the shock on my child's face and was like, like you would never do that to an adult without saying something first about what you're doing. I actually, I feel my heart beating right now. I, I thought about going back to the doctor's office a couple weeks after that to talk to that nurse and be like, do not ever do that again to my child or anyone else's child. It takes one second to tell them what you're about to do. Mm -hmm. And shots are very tricky because kids don't want to get shots once they get to the point where they know what to expect. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, doctor's offices are tricky. And I will say the one other thing that was huge for me, it doesn't seem like a big deal, the, the like changing your child's position, but it is rampant, rampant that kids are spend like 90% of their time in a baby carrier, a car seat, a stroller, or even when they're at home in there's these seats that you can put your kid in mm. where uh, it's called like a bumbo seat or something where they can sit there and be sort of contained because let's say maybe you're cooking and you don't want your kid crawling around in the kitchen or whatever mm. so what i learned from janet lansbury it's so simple but it's so revolutionary is like lay your baby on the floor mm. lay them on the floor just lay them on the floor, mm -hmm. put blankets out or whatever you want to do, put a gate up, lay the baby down. Because I carried, I think I carried my baby 24 seven for like the first six months. She was either like in the bed with me or in a baby carrier or whatever. And like, yeah, it's like, okay, put your kid in a stroller if you're going for a jog or whatever. But um, they, they, they need to be able to move freely. Here's the other thing parents do is they sit their child up and if the child can't get into the sitting position on their own, they often can't get out of it. Mm -hmm. So then they're stuck there mm -hmm. and they look like they're doing okay, but they actually can't move. Yeah. They're stuck. They can't get out of that sitting position. So it'd be better for them to just be on their back or rolling over or whatever. And the book says, yeah, their back's actually not made to sit like that. It's not a, it's not a good, it's not a good position for them. Their bodies are resilient. They can handle it, but it's, it's just not a good position for them. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm still, it's not even just the butthole. I mean, it's just that respect of your children. And, and there is a, there is a guideline that Janet has in the book where she says, don't do anything to your child's body without telling them first, that's their body. Don't do anything to your child's body without telling them first. And I, hadn't been doing this with Arlo when I do diaper changes and stuff, you know, I mean, he's a month old or less or whatever. So you and have been doing it? I haven't. No, I hadn't considered yeah. it, but of course now I'm Yeah, going I wasn't to either. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. But, then, but like, we don't even think of it. Even at that age, like, even if it's just for me to get the practice, you know, I do think he probably understands it. I do think these children get way more than we ever think that they do. But even if it's just for me, it's just like, this is your 
foot. This is your arm. I don't get to manhandle it through a sleeve without you at least knowing what I'm doing with it. And Bonnie, my baby's mom, she was doing that. I don't know if that just comes naturally to her or if it's from a book she's read, but she's been, she's been awesome like that. She's been, when she does change his diaper, she tells him everything. She tells him in sign language or tells him, tells him just verbally, now we're going to do this, now we're going to do that. It's beautiful. And Janet tells a story. No, I think Magda Gerber told a story of like, yeah, just like a diaper change that just brought tears to her eyes mm. from a Ukrainian orphanage or something like that. And she said it was just like this woman just saying, now I'm going to do this. Now I'm moving your foot and now I'm doing this. And then like finish the thing and just said like, you're going to like it here or something. And it was just like this beautiful, beautiful diaper change. Mm. And I've been, you know, wanting to just rush through him. My, my little boy cries when, when, I mean, at least when he was, you know, zero, <laughs> I mean, like one month or whatever, weeks old, he didn't, he didn't like it. It was kind of cold and yeah, he would cry. And so I wanted to like rush through him. And this last visit, um, you know, Bonnie said, you don't need to rush through him. He's okay. Just tell him what, just tell him what you're doing. Yeah. And to say like, okay, like the wet, here comes the wipe and it's going to be cold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was very, very grateful for that advice early on. I had, I wasn't doing it either until I read that. And then I thought, oh, of course, you know, I actually remember when Elsie Jane was really little, her diaper table, or actually just her dresser with the diaper pillow thing on top was right underneath the window in her room. And diaper changes became like a real treat, actually, because we would sit at that window and by the time she was starting to pull up on things, she would pull up on the window and we would just both stick our heads out the window and like look at the trees or listen to the birds or the flowers or whatever. And that was like our hangout time, you know, it can be kind of a special thing. Yeah. God, I thought that diaper changes were never going to end. And then now I like can barely even remember. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even that long ago. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have anything else to say about the book, but I love this last topic. And it's, for me, it just feels so profound, especially, I don't know why I want to say, especially for little girls, but, but yeah, I want to teach all of our kids. And for whatever reason, especially little girls that yeah their bodies are theirs and and starting at like one day old like they can't take care of their body but the the, the first step that, that we can do to like honor that their body is theirs is anytime we touch it anytime we do anything to it we tell them what we're doing yeah, yeah. absolutely all right. Well, um, let's not make any plans for the next episode. People can just join us if they if they liked this one. You and I can maybe make some plans uh, yeah. off, off, offline. We could, do, we could do children's books. I want to just sit in a library and just uh -huh. read a hundred children's books. And, and, you know, of course I've had so many recommended and people have bought them for me and, and whatever, but that's what I want to do. And with COVID, I can't do that right now. I can't just yeah. go through it and, and read a hundred children's books, but yeah. that's what I want to do. Last week after we spoke, I spent a long time looking for these, uh, these feelings books uh, by, I think her name is Sarah Medina, which I loved. No judgment, no rights and wrongs, no sadness is better, is, is worse than happiness or any of those things. And, teaching kids what I view as the building blocks of their own moral compass, which is the ability to understand other people and contemplate other people's feelings and emotions. Again, without taking responsibility for those emotions, without anything, it's just building literacy in, in facial action coding and building literacy in tone of voice and building literacy in posture. And, and um, I, love those books and they are selling for like 300 bucks each on ebay because they've been out of print and people want them as badly as i do i bought the whole set 
And I'm um, kind of over my resentment for my sister throwing them away. Um, oh, no. But I can't find anything like them. So I want to sit down at a library and, and look at hundreds of books. And I think it'd be awesome for us to review children's books. I also want us to review adult books. I think a lot of my parenting um, philosophy comes from like Ralph Waldo Emerson and from, and from my child's middle name is Emerson. Uh, ideas that weren't really designed to apply to children but uh -huh. but just permeate permeate how we want to live our life and that apply, that includes how we raise our children yeah so if anyone wants to make any suggestions feel free to put them in the comment box all right well thank you kara um yeah if you have any suggestions for next week i'm happy to happy to chat about them but otherwise uh, it's nice spending an hour with you yeah you too all right i'll talk to you soon okay